Assalamu alaikum. I know that all of you know the meaning of this. Um, well, you know, I look to all of you and I say, uh, this is the group that can be called the uh, die-hard architecture and heritage lovers, right? You're still in the room after all of this, such a very long day. So I'm really happy to share this session. And therefore, we will have uh, a beautiful, vibrant session for you. And one of the evidences for that is that uh, we will have local voices talking about the local heritage. I go all over the place and people are talking about, foreigners are talking about the heritage of the locals, not necessarily that we would have the opportunity of locals talking about their own heritage. So I think it's, it's wonderful in this session that we will have two speakers, and I will elaborate, talking about the local heritage. And then we will have also two dear colleagues, uh, Professor Nicholas from uh, Oman, uh, a German University of Technology in Oman, and also uh, uh, Professor Salim Fordawi, my colleague from Qatar University. Um, I am in the process of finalizing a book that I am writing in Arabic about what I call the, the critical narrative of contemporary architecture and urbanism in Qatar where I described my two dear brothers and colleagues, Ibrahim al-Jida and Muhammad Ali Abel, as the local heroes of architecture in Qatar. And I'm not actually flattering them. Uh, my description is related to what I call the, the struggle journey that both of them went through. They came back from the States around the uh, mid-80s, late-80s, and both of them, they rejected the temptation of falling in love only of what they have learned from the states, but they had a sort of uh, local commitment and local responsibility to their country, to their context, to their heritage and their culture. They also had a very severe competition because at that time, we subscribed to the model of we want to hire foreign consultants. So imagine in the late 80s for two young comers to literally struggle to, to trying to have a sort of a spot on the platform of practicing architecture and urbanism in Qatar. There are also both of them so much excited about the notion of nourishing the new generations and helping the new generation. So all, every single day, and I'm observing them quite closely, every single day they're trying to help new generations to sort of continue this process of preserving heritage and also coming out with a new language and a new expression related to architecture of Qatar. And also they have a social responsibility in terms of knowledge share and knowledge dissemination. They write, they publish essays, they bu publish books, and therefore they want to make sure that this, what I call it, knowledge project, is a sort of consistent. Um, I am utterly humbled to share this session, and I'm really looking forward to the knowledge and the learning that I will get from both of you, and also from Professor Salim and Professor Nicholas. The order of the session is uh, Brother Ibrahim, then Brother Muhammad, then Professor Nicholas and Professor Salim, and then I brought four chairs here because I know that we will have vibrant Q&A session. Thank you so much. Rahim. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction, uh, my dear Ali, inspiring. Uh, I'm not going to mention some of the books that you wrote that could get you in trouble about criticizing some of the architecture around our region, but it will be nice to share it one day. Uh, I was asked to talk for 10, 15 minutes just to stir up the discussion. And interestingly, uh, I'm going to be talking about the history of Qatari architecture, but as I described, the gentleman who's going to speak after me, I learned a lot of things that I'm going to describe from you from him. <laughs> so he will maybe shed a few items in depth. Uh, when I came back, there wasn't any reference whatsoever except for some photocopies, booklets, and it's so exciting to see 
they used to call it the French Expedition uh, Survey. And here I'm delighted finally after so many years to meet uh, the two brains behind it. Uh, and that was a beautiful reference for me. And the reason, as I collected all the search and uh, I put my hand into a wonderful survey commissioned by municipality back uh, in the years, which I doubt if they even know where it's archived because nobody have ever used it, but I put my hand on it, translated it into sketches and some analysis. And I said the title 1800 to 1950 1800 is when Althani sort of united the tribes in this peninsula uh, and the formation of a nation started uh, its footsteps. And 1950, when the wealth of the oil started coming. So that era finishes in terms of architecture between these years. And the prehistoric Qatar, the fourth, I mean, I'm going to show you prototypes of these buildings, but within these, uh, I'm sharing some of the images that are in the book, but within these I'm going to give some of my sort of feelings or uh, criticism on, on certain eras and periods that happened. Interestingly, uh, Katara, where we see the Katara uh, the village that's uh, for entertaining and lec the lectures and uh, restaurants and so on, so the name Katara goes back to 170 years before uh, AD, uh, which is quite ancient. And uh, I read throughout that there was definitely uh, people coming to get some of the shells, to get some colors for the royalties of, of Iraq back, back in the years. So there was a lot of dwellings, and they found this, and Rob will shed a on oh, Thursday, I think you will, we will learn a lot more from him, but it was very interesting to see the word Katara goes way, way back then. And it's interesting, such an old map is almost very, quite accurate. <clears throat> and what forms this architecture? What forms this culture, this accent, this clothing, the food that we eat? I think our ancestors did a good job traveling and uh, the pearl diving industry, as it was booming, there was a lot of traveling. And with that, we brought in a lot of cultures. And even the tribes here, when there was wars and starvation, they would migrate to the other side and vice versa and continue the traveling. Because the whole world was there between us and the rest of the Arab world, there was a big desert. Mecca was the only thing that you had to go to, but there wasn't much crossing of the desert. Everything was done by the sea. And I'll shed a light on this. So what forms this culture? This applies to, I think, most of our region, but what forms this culture? In my opinion, well, Oman, it is said, and I read this, that the Omanis were the first people to teach this civilization how to sail against the wind. So their travels, and they, they, they showed discover, people who discovered Asia the way to get to there. So there is an ancient history, and as they expanded and brought in a lot of trading for us, Zanzibar, because of the trade, the slave trade, a lot of our music actually is from Zanzibar. These beautiful carved doors and boxes are from Zanzibar. But all of this has penetrated and into our culture and became Basra. Basra was a civilized, even the first missionaries started there. When the Ottomans ruled the region through there, the British had an influence there to rule these smaller towns back then. And of course, Najd, this is where the tribes came from. Uh, the rulers came from and main tribes came from Najd. India, our ancestors used to dive to get the pearls so the Maharaja can put it on his turban. So this was an important trading for us. And we think biryani is Qatari food and sambusa is Qatari food. So it really, it really blended in into our culture. And of course, the next shore that shares almost the same size of what we have on this side, and which is full of Arab tribes until uh, 40s, 50s, still there is. Uh, so all of this has created, I think, our architecture, our accents, foods, musicals, and you name it. And that melting pot really is quite unique. And I'm so glad that 
we're talking about the Gulf architecture because as I studied back in Texas, there was the Adobe style of architecture. And I think it's about time that this style of architecture is recognized as one of the mankind sort of heritage of style of architecture, as it is so unique only to, these, to this Gulf. The growth, 37, it was a bad time. The artificial pills coming, people were literally bankrupt. There were stories that people started selling their dentures, the wood of their houses, and migrate elsewhere as they didn't have anything to sell. That happened after a thriving, where our fleet of Dows were in the hundreds. That was really thriving, and I'll show you why it was thriving. But again, in 37, the Empire State Building had lifts, and the Brooklyn Bridge had cars. So we've gone really a long way in such a short period. But then with the oil, the growth started coming, and all of us are witnessing. We see all these fancy developments of seafront villas, seafront pearl, or whatever it is, but most of the population had a seafront. Uh, you park your boat right in front of your uh, garden, or whatever, if you had a garden. That spot in the map is where the best and the most prime pearl diving locations, and it was just right in front of, of Doha. So Doha and Al Khor and the city. So even the Kuwaitis, when they wanted to, to dive, they would come all the way to this location. So that's why the, our fleet of Daos was thriving and it was very close. And like I said, when it was a thriving business with hundreds of Daos and all of a sudden bank bankrupt, we heard of big merchants got really bankrupt and sold everything they had. So I'll take you through some of the prototypes. Uh, the forts, Zabara Fort is quite famous. We know of the Zabara city that was thriving in the 1600s and the 1700s. Schools were there. They even had an interesting uh, water channel that led into closer to the town, but they found a full industry that was happening back there. The Umm Salal is quite unique and interesting. This is where you mix, and probably this happened throughout stages, mix the fort, and we see here a reflection of the Najd style. This is the very typical that goes slightly pointed, but here we see the dwelling happening within the fort, and it's quite unique, and th I think this place is really, uh, it's being renovated, it has been renovated finally, but it's, it's, it's quite unique into defining what is so Qatari architecture with all the influences that we have spoken, but it became unique in its own self. Merwib, it goes back to the Abbasi era, interestingly, so when the Abbasids were expanding, uh, they had a presence uh, within uh, most of the region. Erkayat, it's the uh, 18th century. The Mustic buildings, this is quite unique and uh, interesting, but of course, this is the most important building. Interestingly, uh, when I came back in the 80s, no attention was uh, being done to the local vernacular as it was being demolished, and I'll show you some sad examples. But fortunately, the late uh, Amir Sheikh Khalifa uh, had the vision and he said, let's renovate this. And uh, he commissioned a team in the 70s to survey and started the rebuilding. And that has won even the Aga Khan Award for restoration. And this became a, sim a, s a symbolic sort of reference to what is unique Qatari architecture. And the, that majlis and the that square one in the middle, I think it's, it's a, a, a very unique. Uh, I have my put my hand into uh, a gift for for the opening. It was sold in an auction for the opening of of the museum back in the 70s, given by Sheikh Khalifa to the guests. Uh, a rare piece of that that room. And then different type of dwellings, but we see the courtyard houses. Some of these, even when they were surveyed, had extensions that we see, typical squares. But basically, you get a courtyard, you start with two rooms. As the family grows, you add rooms. And that's how the dwellings started coming up. 
Another thing, these recesses that are in the elevation, as decorative as they may be, but they were a structural element that I learned from Hamad, that they wanted to wait to make the, the weight of the walls thinner. So they had to recess them because they have less stones to do so, and so they don't put much weight, but so creative that they made it into a decorative feature. And in some cases, it, had, it will have openings, and so it will catch the wind into the, whether it's on the roof or into the rooms. Uh, this was, again, in the survey, we see it in the posters down uh, under, but Qatar was really never known to be a wind tower uh, architecture. Historically, there was, at least I know of two, and they say there was a third one, uh, but this was one of the most, the Nasrallah house was the most dominant fancy one, uh, and it works. I stood under this wind tower, and the breeze really does work. Uh, I think it's a genius invention, but the form of wind towers that was used here was more of the recesses and the parapets of the roof as the roof was an inhabited area and the wind would slide into the roof area. Different styles of buildings, we see patterns, but this is very typical. You'll see the Liwan as a shaded area. And uh, as I was briefly saying this morning, there are very interesting lessons to be learned at least for the new creative generation as they use these elements not as a skin but as a function as a genius uh, coping uh, and adapting to the harsh environment around how could these people really live and enjoy and get still creative into these things and they had solutions to do that that we need to learn from we started seeing some of the patterns on the right this is definite influence uh, from uh, traveling, but the size of your room is the size of your piece of wood that you have to hold your roof. So the rooms were not small due to wanting a smaller spaces, but if your dental is three meters, so this is as much as you can span. Expand, span. So different examples, different sort of measure B is for privacy, but all these houses grew up stage by stage. This is Al Uthman house, and now it's within the Mesher project. And I heard stories of when Al Uthman moves to where Mesher is, they, say, they told them, oh, you're leaving town, you're going so far away from civilization, they're in the middle of nowhere, and that's Mesher. It's uh, another Sheikh's house. We see the entrances are quite important, usually, and there is the Dacha where people sit outside, and Majlis is usually adjacent to that. But I remember the days where people would sit outside and greet each other and invite them for coffee and so on. It's, it's, it's a social thing. We see this in a lot of houses also in Al Wakra and Al Rayyan. This is near Al Khalifi. Uh, there was an area called Al Khalifat, Sharq. So where the museum is, was Sharq, and this is all dominated by Salaiti families. And then further down, there was Al-Hitmi, and then Sharq, where the Sharq Hotel is, al Khulafa area. Uh, area. Uh, it's a neighborhood uh, dominated by uh, certain families in some locations. But this particular building has good memories because they turned it as they renovated it earlier on. And when I graduated, it was the Fine Arts Society. Uh, this is where the artists used to gather, and in the room, some of our late founders of the art were there. I was a member, and this is where I met Muhammad, uh, as we were both uh, emerging artists. Uh, Rayan, well, this was renovated, so I think a lot of the de decorative features were added during renovation <coughs> because this was sort of quite well decorated, but which I don't think was the case. Uh, during construction, maybe in the lower areas, but even in the outside parapets, I think this was exaggerated. Al Mana House also has been documented. Uh, this was a thriving majlis. Uh, Al Mana is a, uh, w goes way back into education, and they were the first to teach uh, and to make law. And so, this, when there is a ruler of a nation comes, they would stay in these majlises. I took this photo, and interestingly, this documents 
the guy is documenting signing the architects. This is when they they can sign their names on the buildings. We cannot do it anymore. But it's Abdullah Al Mail, and he's saying داخل الدار صلي على النبي المختار شغل Abdullah Al Mail. Abdullah Al Mail is the genius mason who built the. He was the architect of evidently of the rich. He's the guy who built the the museum, which is the the first example I showed you, the ruler's house, and he built this majlis. And it will be nice to one day have an award or some research maybe in the next sessions, the next years to come, because uh, his family still exists and if they have any history of what he has accomplished, it will be interesting to sort of acknowledge his efforts into putting our architecture and our identity. Al Majid House, this is on where the banks are, Hamad Grand Hamad. Al Fardam building happens to sit on, on this where on this building. I think after researching this was the biggest mansion uh, biggest house I've seen. Uh, it was a gorgeous piece of architecture. The elements even of the wind catchers, you see the pieces of wood and the recesses up there, you open them and the wind would definitely uh, slide in into the living room. The Liwans, the sort of mashrabiyas uh, are there. It's, it's a, it definitely is a perfect example. And as I walked out, the truck was there, and the guys moved in to remove the doors and the windows to knock it out. And you know that there is these incidents that happen to you in your life, an accident or something that will change your life totally. That incident really made me open my mind into what is happening to our vernacular, how can we protect it, and why are we knocking them out? And later in the 90s, there was a great comeback thanks to His Highness Sheikh Hamad, and to preserving this history and documenting it. But the building is gone. Mosques, nobody would dare to demolish a mosque. That's why they survived. <laughs> uh, and it was, it's really sculptural, uh, some of them. And you would see the size of the minaret, the shape of the minaret was based on the mason, what's material is there, but again, like I said, the span is the span of the dental that you have. And there are some beautiful examples, whether in the Shark area still existing, fortunately, in Shamal and uh, in different locations, but all of these have been documented. In the book, because of the survey, each one had a name, uh, and this is how it was documented. But just I mean, look at these minarets, they're very sculptural. In, in its own right, it's quite contemporary in its own right in some cases. This style of minaret started appearing not only here, but within the region. This was the first sort of modernizing, but way back in the pre-oil period, but this is when they could afford it, so where the Mu'adhan would, would be able to go a little bit higher. But we see this in a lot of towns, even uh, within the Iranian towns or the throughout, from Kuwait all the way to most of the villages throughout the Gulf. Al-Qabib Mosque was built in Al-Zabara in the 1700s. And the founder of the nation, Sheikh Jassim, when he saw it, he said, I also want to do something inspired by that. Uh, I managed to sort of collect the data and publish it in a book called it The 99 Domes. Uh, and it was rebuilt in Doha. Uh, later in the 17 or 1800s, it was rebuilt and then it was knocked out. Then the municipality built it in uh, 90s and knocked out and was rebuilt by Muhammad as in, in the stones. And he has stories how they have rebuilt it in real stones. Souk, there wasn't much souks. Most of the souks were an opening in a dwelling or so on in Al Jasra as you walk in some of the older areas in Souk Waqif. But Souk, Al Bakr Souk was famous back then. It's a little bit more modern, but uh, it was an active. This is where Souk Waqif literally, the, the real old Souk Waqif area is. And Rob, you see the, the, the it is non-decorative. It wasn't like the pointed one, the edges, which was a reinforcement, but eventually became a decorative where the, the beam meets the column, as we were discussing earlier today. So very organic growth with 
really answer uh, worth analyze, analyzing and the, the Harvard research really did, I hope it gets published one day. Uh, uh, Dr. Nader has been tracing it and it's with uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University, so hopefully they will, they will finally publish it as it started with the Musharab project. Uh, of course, inspired by Her Highness to do such a research where, where a research has been done. I was honored to be part of the team uh, in Harvard and coming back here, but to see the results of it and the analysis that they've done really proves that people lived comfortably there and managed to live. The souks were straightforward as we have discussed. There have been some reincarnation in the Sugwagif now of these elements and it's working. And this is where I say uh, there are lessons to be learned. Now in the West we put big windows and end up putting big curtains that we never open. But somebody really have done an exercise where each single breeze of wind has been calculated and understood. And these are, I think, is the basic analysis that anybody should start by designing a building. And this is where I'm saying, with the influence of the architecture, the aesthetics, making it into a more contemporary, to this, well, I call it, going back to basics, these elements, I think, could be useful. And eventually, the sort of international movement came. People were taken out. Well, they were very happy to be taken out because the oil came and they saw villas in Beirut and in Mumbai and in Cairo, and they wanted to move in these villas with balconies that they, we could never sit in these balconies. But from these beautiful courtyard houses that could be regenerated, re in my opinion, with privacy, you sit in these boxes, nobody goes to the outside. And I remember my older aunts and so on as they moved from these houses to these houses became prisoners of the walls inside these boxes. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'm trying to you know, as, a, as an architect, as a painter, as, uh, yeah, uh, as a painter, uh, we were always uh, had a problem of who we are, what is our identity. Yes. Uh, and uh, so uh, the identity, it is a, an, an open question uh, that, uh, not anyone had the, the, the right or the perfect uh, answer for it. But I do remember that I, I, one day I, I had a problem with uh, one architect who said, uh, do you really have an, an uh, identity for your art or architecture in this part of the world? Everything in this place is imported. The only thing that you have here, it is a sand, camel, and some oil, which of course it was, uh, it made me, you know, that was in 1980s, and I started, I took my camera and I started collecting uh, data, collecting photos, just to see who we are. So I collected, again, a lot of photos, and I published my book, uh, Ornament of the Gulf, in 1985, just trying to, to say, no, we have something here. We have, we have a root uh, in this ground. And um, uh, it is not uh, true that everything that uh, we see or our, our true art is imported uh, uh, through the, the surrounding countries. Okay, so uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, I'll be talking about Pearl, Pearl as a center of, of our, uh, our, our life. And uh, uh, also the 7,500 years that the Pearl's era took before it, uh, its end in the 1930s. And uh, the Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh uh, legend, 
uh, and mentioning the pearl uh, in his legend. Then I am talking about the population, the, the, uh, the, the definition of uh, the geography of the Gulf, definition of the population, and uh, bringing some models uh, of uh, the architecture just to show the common characteristic uh, in the, the whole Gulf area that they share the same, the same rules, uh, the same style, they belong to the same, uh, uh, they use the same uh, method of construction. So uh, the, this is what uh, the human fate in, in the Gulf was uh, uh, tied to it. You know, uh, uh, I was reading an, an article that uh, uh, the French expedition uh, team in UAE in uh, Umm al Qawain in the uh, uh, March 2014, they discovered, they were uncovering uh, uh, a site there and they discovered a pearl. And after testing this pearl, they found that this pearl goes back uh, to 5500 BC. And they uh, claiming that this is the oldest. Uh, uh, pearl, uh, it was found. So it, it means something to this area, because uh, uh, Gilgamesh will come after, and he will mention it in his legend too. So uh, the pearl was so important uh, to our life uh, in the Gulf. Uh, if someone uh, wants to be uh, rich, he must have a lot of it. And, uh, uh, and, uh, if so, uh, and the town could be impoverished if they couldn't go to bring this commodity from the sea. And they could be colonized even because of this richness that as a result of having pearls. You know, we know that the Portuguese were in the area and they controlled the area just because uh, the area was so rich because of this uh, pearl. Uh, so, and even when a, a man loved a, a, a woman, uh, the, the gateway to her heart was to have this pearl uh, presenting her, or it might be her, her condition to, to agree with him. And even the, the stories that was told to the children in the past, uh, it was about the diver and how he was able to go into a very dangerous places and bringing this uh, wealth out. So it is, uh, in other words, this community was the center uh, of the life of the people. Now, if you look at the timeline, I call it the Pearl Era. It was, as I mentioned, Pearl of Umm al -Qawain. Uh, it is 5,500 BC. Gilgamesh uh, uh, epic, uh, he mentioned uh, the, uh, the pearl uh, as, uh, as he call it, uh, I'll come close to it, uh, the uh, eternal, eternal uh, uh, rose. So, and then the Hellenistic uh, but uh, and the end of it was at uh, 19, uh, 1929 when the uh, uh, Japanese pearl hit the area. So uh, in the uh, epic of Gilgamesh, uh, it says that there was a snake that came out while he was resting and putting the, the rose of eternity close to him and he took it and uh, stole that uh, pearl away from him. So uh, uh, as, a, as a story, we, we say that the, the snake dies, but he just come out of the dead skin and he is reborn again. So that's because he, he took that pearl away from Gilgamesh. When Gilgamesh uh, uh, was talking about uh, this incident, he mentioned that he put a, a, a stone or a weight to his feet and he put something to lock his nose 
to go under the sea and get it. And this uh, practice was known uh, until recently. The diver, they were doing the same, the same tool. They were using the same tools, actually. So the fate of uh, man in the Gulf was tied to the pearl. He was captive to it. He just couldn't free himself. This was the source of uh, the life. This was a source of prosperity. This was a source of his strength uh, in the area uh, for him. But one day, one day, the serpent with, with red eyes, this is the, the Japanese uh, flag, uh, uh, showing that it is st stole the, the, took the pearl away from the, the people of the Gulf. And this is, I am just putting it into a metaphoric uh, uh, picture. So when, when we want to think about the Gulf, what is Gulf? What is the land of Gulf? I think the, the Gulf, it is like this. It is about 50 kilometer depth into land going around the sea. If you go beyond the 50 kilometer, you begin to see a, a different culture, a different style, a different identity. But if you are within this 50 kilometers around the Gulf, you would see a, a very typical of the Gulf, as I'll show you uh, later on this uh, presentation. And then uh, when we talk about the people of the Gulf, who are the people of the Gulf? People of the Gulf, actually, uh, during the, the, the pearl season, uh, people were, were migrating from, uh, from the inland, going toward the sea in order to participate uh, in the uh, pearl season, which was from uh, June until September every, every year. So it was the summertime. So a lot of people were coming into the Gulf to share this wealth that will come out of the sea. Uh, uh, some of them, they, they stayed in the Gulf, some of them, they went back. But the main stream of, uh, of immigration, it was always coming from the peninsula. And uh, sometime, if the political uh, uh, situation was unstable, they will even move to the other side of the Gulf. What was the norm of the, of the life for the people in the Gulf? They had two kinds of life, the summer and winter. During the summer, as I said, it was uh, only during the month of June till uh, uh, month of septem uh, September, people were all busy with the sea. And after the, uh, when they are, uh, were coming to the month of October, everybody moved to the desert. The desert was so generous and the rainfall was much higher than, than now. So the people, you know, uh, they, they, they just flourished with this uh, uh, grass and beautiful weather that uh, it was uh, in, the, uh, in the desert. But uh, they, um, they weren't resembling Bedouin, you know. They are totally different, the Bedouin culture uh, uh, that uh, uh, we know about. And then if we talk, talk about the ge geographical influence uh, on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the Gulf, what happened that we have at the north of the, uh, uh, or the east side of the Gulf, we have Zograt uh, uh, mountains. And these mountains uh, worked as a barrier uh, for the northern culture to come to the Gulf. So it was some sort of uh, separation of, of culture. While in the western side, there is um, a, a, a very tough uh, uh, sand barrier that separates the Gulf from the Najd or the highland of the peninsula. So this uh, actually uh, made the whole Gulf 
to be, uh, to be communicating with each other while they weren't able to, uh, to get the influence from the north or from the south. And uh, to my opinion, I think that uh, the Gulf people were uh, so active, they had a very strong uh, sense of identity and, uh, and art and culture, uh, and they have influenced, uh, for example, uh, the Calicut area and the Zanzibar uh, area, and not as a lot of scholars uh, talk that the influence from there came to, to, to our uh, area, and uh, I have uh, uh, yeah, the uh, evidence to, to prove that. So if we come to the architecture, uh, when we uh, uh, study architecture, we try to, to look at two things, just to see the similarities and to look at the dominant factor uh, in it, to say that yeah, they, are, they belong to the same school. So we have the, the construction, construction method and, and the building, and then the, uh, the decorative uh, in, in, the, in the building, especially the patterns and, uh, and the gypsum and the, and the wooden uh, element. Here I, I, need, I will take you to a tour in the Gulf uh, to show you uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, how it is similar uh, around the Gulf. So first of all, if we go to the to this area, it is Qashim Island. There is a town called Laft. I visited this uh, place. It just uh, it is uh, it is a town that has freezed in the history. You could see how the Gulf and the eastern side uh, or western side uh, looked like. So, you know, if I look into this picture without showing which part belong to, it is very hard to say if it is Bahrain, Qatar, or Kuwait. The second uh, uh, town, it is uh, Kong uh, Island, uh, Kong uh, Town. It is only about five kilometer away from Linja. Again, this is the house of Nabina. They are very famous uh, in, uh, in uh, Doha here. They have a, a, a Nabina uh, uh, trade. And then Linja. This is Linja, for example. These are all, most of these houses are the uh, uh, houses that belong to Arabs. You know, most of these houses, because the whole area, uh, the Arabs were, were living in it. But I think during the 1905, when the, uh, the father of Shah decided to uh, 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 put tax on this area. A lot of people here, they were uh, a very uh, important business people and traders. So they just left their town and they came to the Arab side. If we go to Boucher, for example, again, you know, the, the similarity, the, 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 the color of the buildings, the, the methods of, uh, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't show which side of the, the Gulf you are. If we go to Kuwait, for example, uh, this uh, the Kuwaitis, uh, their architecture is influenced mainly by by the uh, Boucher town and by Basra, but it is belong to it. This is Bahrain, and this is Al Gatif, for example. These are the places we, which we don't know a lot about it. But again, this, uh, this building, the way I, I photographed it, it shows the skeleton, the structure, the wooden beams that holding the, the building, the, the grid, the, the, the making of the arches in the building. It is a beautiful picture that we can learn a lot from it. Al Gatif, and then if we go to Al Hufuf, which is Al Ahsa, you know we are now yani, uh, going farther from the from the Khalij, from the Gulf. Here we begin to see a little bit a different style, a different touches. They are closer to uh, uh, Najdian, uh, the highlands of uh, a peninsula. So here 
you begin to see a little bit uh, different touches. And of course, uh, Lucille in, uh, in Qatar. And the last uh, picture is about Dubai. So uh, these are the, uh, the uh, mainly uh, uh, a very quick tour just to show uh, the similarities of the architecture and the, in the around surrounding the Gulf. And by the way, most of these uh, towns are, you know, built by the sea. Now, uh, if, uh, we want to talk a little bit about the unified rules and, uh, and grammars uh, in the buildings. Uh, they, uh, I noticed that, you know, when they are building, they, they always they begin the building of any walls by keeping this void it is 30 centimeter columns and 90 centimeter void uh, it is like this the, the 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 structure of the building and then we goes i i i go to more details about it in a minute but you see this uh, line the crossing line you know when he rises the building up to two meters then this is the maximum that the wall can hold uh, when it is uh, built from clay and, and mud. So he needs to put a tie beam at that level in order to be able to go up another one meter, for example. So uh, uh, the, the material here which dictated uh, the architect to follow the rules uh, and not the rules that was uh, made by the architect. architect. So this uh, line, we always see it, and it is a pure uh, structural element. There is no uh, decorative uh, element that we see in, in, in this. This is a pure, uh, pure uh, uh, structural elements and rules that he has to follow. And as we see in Sukhwaka, for example, this is rhythmic, rhythmic uh, uh, that we see it balances everything. And he can use it like, uh, like playing a piano or music, you know, uh, uh, putting all this vocabularies together to show a beautiful uh, buildings. Uh, uh, there is no colors. There is no color except the color of wood in the building. But uh, because he playing with this uh, recesses and with this uh, deep uh, uh, void, he's getting, uh, uh, he's catching the, 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 the shadow and coloring his building with it. So if we go to the construction method, I'll, I'll flip this one quickly. So he starts with the foundation. And then he has to build a colonnade wall. It is like this. It is the, the space between the, co the columns is about 90, and the columns itself, it is 30, except the corner one, which is 50 by 50. Then after that, he needs to put a tie beam, which is a dentil. And then after putting this dentil, he is able to go another uh, one and a half meter, probably higher. And then he needs another tie beam, which is a top uh, tie beam. So can you see this grid is starting to appear, the vertical and the horizontal line starting to appear. Now, he will have to close the, uh, the upper part with the panels. We call it wall panels. And then he can uh, add the roofs. After adding the roof, the, the upper lintel, he needs to put support arch for it. Because the lifespan of the wood within these lintels is about 30 to 50 years. Uh, most of the building that I restored, you know, I opened this lintel and you see that the dentil has disappeared has been eaten by the termite. So he knew that this is a problem that might 
make his building collapse. So that's why he is putting these arches. So just in case if the denture disappeared, these arches will carry on the, the roof for him. And then, of course, the parapet. And then he will add the wooden parts, uh, windows. And, and when it comes, uh, so uh, looking at uh, the building like this, it is supposed to be readable by, by the architect. You know, he knows where, where he needs lentils, he needs, and it, when, uh, when he rendered the building, it just give it this beautiful, a decorated uh, facade that he, he will get. Uh, the, uh, by the, uh, the columns, he is using uh, three types of columns, the square one, and the arches again, three types, uh, the rounded one, uh, half rounded, like this one, and then we have the cylindrical uh, uh, columns with pointed arch, and the last one is the cornered uh, support uh, uh, arches. It is actually because he is using uh, at that point uh, uh, dentures, wood. So uh, it is very dangerous to, to not let ha that kind of support to be there. Otherwise, uh, if the, the denture disappear in 30 to 50 years, that means the whole uh, ceiling might, might collapse. And thank you very much for your listening. Thank you um, very much. I would like to introduce myself briefly. My name is Nikolaus Knebel. I'm a professor of architecture and urban design at the German University in Muscat, Oman. And uh, I have the feeling that um, given the context here, my presentation is maybe a bit of a risky thing because I'm not a historian by background, um, even though I'm very interested in the history of architecture and I'm not from the region. I'm a German architect. However, I've been here for eight and a half years in Oman now and uh, I'm always happy to find an exchange with the neighboring universities and academics. So my background is uh, that of an architect, a researcher, an educator, and I'm interested when I reflect about um, what I teach to my students is the question of what matters. What really matters that I um, prepare for them as knowledge? And I think about that often because in my career over the last years, I have uh, taught in many what's called emerging markets. I've uh, worked in building up an uh, architecture faculty in Ethiopia, a very quickly developing country. Um, now I'm in Oman, rapid urbanization happening. I'm married to an Indian. I go to India every year. Uh, I see the rapid change in the urban design. I studied in Singapore, um, an equally rapidly expanding and developing uh, city. And what always strikes me about these places is that these are cities that are younger than the inhabitants. Even my students in Oman are older than a lot of their city. That might sound a bit banal, but the longer you think about it, the more it puts the notion of time that we discuss here in a symposium about tradition and heritage into an interesting perspective. And therefore, I'm uh, very happy that there is a discussion about the question of where is the upper end on the time scale for defining what is traditional architecture of the Gulf. So my um, contribution here is to reflect about the two terms of efficiency 
and identity. I think these are the two main streams of discourse here at the moment in the region, if not even uh, beyond. But the problem is that these two discourses about identity and efficiency uh, are disconnected. They do not meet. There are plenty of buildings that are very image driven, that are almost purely about identity. And equally so, there are lots of buildings that are uh, technologically driven, that get certifications for their energy efficiency, however, typologically, they are not very interesting. So my question is, how do these discourses come together? I think the problem is not new. If you uh, read about architects practicing in the 1950s, 60s, um, you find a discussion of the same kind. For example, one of the members of SOM, um, Nathaniel uh, Owings, said when he designed the uh, Hilton Hotel in uh, Istanbul in the late 50s, I think, um, he said it felt to him like doing Turkish architecture and American plumbing and heating. So here again, you have identity efficiency as two separate uh, discussions. So when we look at how we bring these discourses together, I think we need to look at what's called passive design strategies. In the discussion about eco-houses, we separate between what's called active and passive design strategies. So the active strategies are the technological ones, the ones where you need to press a button to get a machine going in order to cool a building. And the more you optimize it, the better. The other discussion is about the so-called passive elements. So all the decisions that have to do with orientation, with construction, and so on. Now, the passive means are, for me, the core architectural themes, because they relate directly to the form that we give to buildings. And I asked myself, what is a good method to carve out knowledge to learn from the passive elements that were used in the historic, in the modern, and the contemporary architecture? And I think, and I'll then go through examples, a good method is to work with patterns. Some amongst the architects of you might remember uh, that there was this big discussion about patterns and pattern language in the 1970s, 80s. A format that was introduced by an architect called Christopher Alexander. And the idea of patterns is to formulate knowledge and disseminate knowledge about what is called proven solutions for recurring problems. So not the specific once uh, only applied solution, but solutions that appear over and over and that seem to be successful for architecture. So I have tried to prepare for you a little panorama about solutions that I think meet both questions, efficiency and identity, and that could be maybe inspiring for a discussion about uh, the architecture of this region. Um, patterns usually have a bit of a colloquial uh, kind of a, a title. So that first pattern that I would like to discuss is that we need to look for cover, of course, because uh, in this latitude uh, around the Tropic of uh, Cancer, we have uh, high impact uh, from solar radiation from the top. So it's all about the roof, the cover that we give to spaces. And a fantastic example to learn from is the 1960s design by Michel Ecochard for the National Museum in Kuwait. 
where we see that the central yard around which the uh, museum is uh, located is covered by a huge uh, space frame and a truss and there are plants growing under this. This is probably uh, a very comfortable shaded public outdoor space that is naturally ventilated. A similar pattern, even though it looks a bit different, I see in the modernist 1980s, um, slightly archaic, rough, but somehow impressive shades. Again, that shade public space. Here it is the main bus station in Abu Dhabi. Um, kind of uh, dramatic forms colored in a bright turquoise. Uh, however, a very comfortable outdoor space that is created. And if we go on, we see this motif now in a much more sophisticated design in the umbrella project by the German engineer Bodo Rasch in Saudi, where you see how a public space can be enhanced by giving it a filtered light, a good natural ventilation and, uh, and shading. Uh, similarly, exactly the same motif we find here in a design for Master City, not built, but uh, strikingly similar. So we can draw a line from these 1960s designs all the way until today. And uh, you might be familiar with this design for a public park, even unbuilt, however seriously trying to build it in Abu Dhabi, the Al Faya Park that is almost an underground uh, park. So looking for cover, finding a roofing for public space, I think is a pattern that works in this region, in this latitude, in this climate, and that is maybe not found in traditional architecture that clearly. However, it would be a unique element if employed more often in this region and could give an identity. Now, if we look further into public space and now a combination of how public space and buildings interact, we see that the buildings are coming under the roof. Here we have, uh, by this is not Paul Rudolph, sorry, this is Sert. Um, the US Embassy in Baghdad, this is a wrong uh, title, sorry. But you see the idea of the building going under the roof. And uh, one of my favorite buildings in Dubai, the Dubai municipality uh, from the 1980s, where you see the representative buildings uh, where the city council and so meets going under this roofed uh, area and the public space that is cooled with the water um, body and with a uh, semi-transparent uh, roof. So a typology of architecture that is modern, that is efficient, but that really works in this area and therefore I think could be part of a discussion about identity. The Bahrain National Museum again uses uh, the, this interplay of roof and volume and of course the fantastic new building uh, of the uh, Louvre. I don't know if you've been there last month, I had the pleasure to be there. Shows the power of creating a shaded outdoor space through having a kind of a umbrella over a cluster of small um, spaces. If we go even a step further, we take the roof away and we look at what the building could do in order to be identity giving and efficiency creating. Uh, we could start our search with this uh, project by Walter Gropius and his team of TAC when uh, they came forward with designs for the university uh, campus in Baghdad. And here we see the whole building, the, a mosque, uh, kind of hovering over the ground and pulling the public space under the building and therefore again providing a great shade and at the same time 
a monument. Um, if we not only look at the Gulf region, but if we go around the uh, Tropic of Cancer, and here we're on 27 degrees north in Jaipur, again, a very hot, dry climate, uh, we see a building lifted off the ground, cooled by water bodies, with, at other places in the building, greenery in that space. We see how a different typology emerges, and I think that is part of the panel here, that we look at which typologies give an identity to this area and drawing this identity from negotiating climatic aspects besides cultural aspects. If you look at the Siemens headquarter in uh, Masta, you see exactly the same pattern of a building hovering over the ground, giving daylight, but limited, just sufficient daylight to the public space under the building. So in, in many places, these spaces don't work, but in this climate, they do. And therefore, I think they're worth considering and exploring and developing. Uh, here is a pavilion uh, for the Dubai Expo by Danish architects, big, where you see again, the building is over the public space. So the public space is not in front of the building, but under the building. And then the building is more like forming a cave over this space. And there's controlled light, uh, water, plants that make uh, the place comfortable. Another pattern we could carve out from the panorama of these projects would be summarized under the slogan to take the outside inside. For example, here, a school in the UAE where the classrooms are clustered around a central courtyard. In the middle, you can see that roof over the central courtyard sticking out. As far as I could research, I might be wrong, but that's my guess, this courtyard is an outdoor space. However, it's almost built like an inside space. So we have this blurred border between what is actually inside and outside. And this is, for me, a point of starting to think about what the identity of architecture could be beyond, say, the traditional typologies that we must study as well, of course. In the fantastic uh, structuralist building of Qatar University, we find similar spaces where actual outdoor is indoor, where it feels like an interior, but it's actually an exterior. And these spaces only work in this climate. In Saudi, you can find uh, exactly the same pattern in Zaha Hadid's uh, energy research center, where you see a huge covered public space between uh, the research labs that are on the right and the left. So this is an architecture that takes the outside inside, and you can't do this everywhere around the globe. So there is a local uniqueness that can be exploited here. Wrap it in is a pattern that um, is obvious. You need two lines of defense, as Louis Kahn uh, said that. You have the sun and the rain border, uh, horizontally or vertically. Um, here is a building from the 1990s, even though it looks even a bit older, uh, from the UAE, or uh, temporary uh, uh, or, or flexible sunshade on the Albar towers in Abu Dhabi, where you see the space between the sunshade and the building evolving into an interesting element. Um, you can find similar discussions in some of the towers in Dubai, where uh, shading and structure are being merged. Um, another pattern that I would like to put out for discussion would start with the um, appearance of 
the traditional architecture of the region. We've seen the Bahla Fort in other presentations today, which I think um, these kind of buildings are stunning in their sculptural quality, in their um, presentation of huge closed planes, and then only very uh, unique and carefully placed uh, openings. And if we follow down that path, we could see that a modern bank building from the 80s, SOM's uh, National Commercial Bank in Jidda, is not so different. Um, it's radical in its closedness and then equally radical in its openness of having these sky gardens cut out. Um, but somehow uh, an architectural language that is efficient and identity giving because it refers to the climate of this place. The national, um, I think it's the Islamic Development Bank in, in Jeddah is actually the title, is a very sculptural building that you could not build in New York or in Berlin or in Frankfurt. This kind of chiseled block only works here and is, is, a, is a chance, I think, for the architectural language here. On a similar latitude, if we just go on a search around the globe and we look at between the, say, 23rd and 33rd degree latitude, this time on the southern uh, hemisphere in Chile, you find, again, the sculptural quality of architecture that can be developed because the light situation, equally to here, has certain conditions that structure buildings differently than if they were further north or south. Um, and of course, a building next door here, we've just uh, visited it, uh, the Qatar Foundation headquarter, again, is a highly sculptural building that is specific in its design to keeping the light out, letting the air through, and if we go further, uh, that brings ventilation into the building. So that's the next pattern. I would call it inhale, exhale, so that there's a breeze going through the building. Of course, the wind towers are the starting point. Uh, we see wind towers in the uh, uh, kind of employed, literally, uh, in the Qatar uh, University buildings. Uh, we see that, again, the same bank building, there is actually a void in the center of this tower so that the wind can go through. The whole building is a wind tower, uh, even though it looks a bit different. And I don't know if you know this project from uh, Kuwait, uh, very recent residential tower that actually, ha it's called wind tower, but it has a wind tower in its core. So typologically, the tower becomes different because the core is no longer there for circulation but it's moved to the sides. And you have a different kind of neighborhood now and a different kind of possibility to ventilate um, the, uh, the apartments. And that comes from thinking about what works efficiently in this region and thus gives an identity. And my last picture is from the inside of the Qatar Foundation headquarter which I think is one of the most inspiring buildings in the region because it brings together efficiency and uh, identity. The inside, outside spaces that are behind this facade are, I think, a sign into where one could go with the architecture of the future by connecting to, in a way, the modern tradition or even before that to the, say, vernacular tradition, taking patterns from there and working out forms that belong to this place. So for me to end this little um, presentation for you here, um, identity efficiency, or you could say appearance and, and performance, were like opposite ends for the last hundred years. 
If you look back almost 100 years from now, actually 99 years ago, the Bauhaus was founded. So the beginning of the modern movement, which led to an international style where functionalism was applied as a universalism, now after 100 years comes to a point where functionalism, making a building efficient, is actually a regionalism. And I find that an interesting closing of the circle of modern architecture after 100 years that I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Well, I am the last speaker today. I know you are tired, and I am tired. However, those uh, lectures or the presentation we just looked at it was really refreshing and make us really love to hear more. And I hope my lecture is going to be contribute to the same attitude you just had from the previous uh, presentations. Um, yeah, the first, uh, the previous speaker, Nicholas, actually, he introduced himself. It's good to introduce yourself when people don't know who you are. Uh, but anyway, I'm just an architect. I had a degree in uh, urban design, another degree in uh, environmental psychology and cultural geography. That's what I am. Uh, I had a lot of work with uh, heritage. Uh, when I was back in Syria, I'm from Damascus, Syria, uh, when I, we did a lot of uh, room, uh, documentation of heritage buildings, almost 80 of them, I built a model for old Damascus with a challenge with Ecoshar, when I just mentioned about Ecoshar, uh, the French architect, before he died, actually, he visited us, and we had a trip to Damascus, and he said, there is no way you can build, make a model out of that one, one to 500, and I did it. And it was, now it is in the museum, in one of the museums in, uh, uh, in Damascus. Uh, anyway, doing, uh, saying, uh, doing, uh, saying that, I went to Saudi Arabia. I introduced myself there to different culture, even though Arabs are, are, are the same in terms of Arabs and language and, and et cetera. But they were really, in terms of culture, too much different, you can see. We went from there to Canada. A uh, few years came back to Sultana. Uh, uh, to Oman, I stayed there in Sultan Qaboos University for a few years, six years almost, and I had one of my uh, colleagues now here. He used to be my student, Haysam al -Abri. I am uh, glad to have him here. He's a doctor now, and he's doing a lot of work related to renovation. Um, now I am mostly working with uh, something related to uh, design uh, issues and uh, social studies uh, in my research. Um, I, I select the topic for this lecture, uh, static and dynamic. When it comes to the traditional architecture, what is static, what is dynamic? The word are not, I didn't find it in social, uh, social uh, uh, literature uh, or, or in, uh, in something related to uh, architecture and, and urban design, but I found it actually in physics and so on. So I have to define it. Static is something when you copy as it is, you don't change it. The way I found it, the only way you can say it, static. You have an arc, it has a, a name, it has a proportion, it has been used by certain uh, culture. You bring it as it is, copy it, and put it there. I can refer to Abdel Wahid Wakil, his work mostly came with that ideas. Static, his work mostly static. Uh, when it comes to dynamic, is you take those elements or styles and you play with it to create a new uh, architecture. However, still has this architecture still remind you of the original of that uh, style. So I went into this notion to, to define uh, uh, some, to, to say something actually about Qatari architecture. Let me talk about the stories, very small one, just to tell us how successful is really Qatar in preserving its own identity. One time I went to Vietnam to attend a conference there. It was my first visit and sitting beside the driver trying to look at the environment. They were driving almost 70, uh, 45 minutes. I have not seen any elements tell me I am in Vietnam, except people who are walking on the, on the streets. I saw French uh, style. I, I saw uh, buildings like modern, we call it modern, but nothing say really uh, Vietnamese architecture or identity. Until I reached my hotels, in my hotel, I found this piece of, piece of art sit beside my bed, the only piece I saw it. And I ask about it, they say, well, this is really 
modern contemporary art, however, it represents also Vietnamese architecture or art in one way. So it has been divided into two parts, mostly with more ornamentation to go back to their uh, heritage, and the other one most with modern. So it's combined in one pieces. I love it. But I came here to the same story about Qatar. I say, okay, when I left the airport, going to the university, what can I see? Everyone can see those uh, light features, very big, huge columns with Islamic art around it, Islamic pattern. You say, okay, is it belong to Qatar or to another wider uh, uh, identity? People mostly refer to it as Islamic, most of the cases. We go there to the uh, Orient uh, Hotel, Sharq. Also, you can see there some heritage. And as you move in, you can go to Sukh Waq, if you can see it. You can see uh, Mushayrib now, and you can see uh, uh, Museum of Islamic Art, and so on, until you reach the Qatar University. You can see also this uh, uh, male uh, uh, old campus, also remind you about something about the region itself. So I say now, well, Qatar is doing fine. Doing is knowing how to preserve its own identity. And also the most important things, it has very good introduction. Once you are getting out of the airport, you are introduced to the culture. I haven't seen that in Vietnam. I will ask any country have this kind of really notion. They're trying to recreate nice introduction to their own identity from the time the tourist, when they leave their airport, they can see this identity or not. It's my questions. I think Qatar is doing fine with that, uh, in that regard, and the thanks go actually to uh, Ibrahim Jida and uh, Muhammad Ali, who they are here, who are having them, and they have their excellent uh, presentation just now. I just make this one very quick, just to see uh, from 1950s, uh, he'll say 30s, uh, 50s, and so on, when we have the tradition was almost dominating the architecture identity. So if I was before that, the red line, this referred to the tradition, could be stable, state, straight. But from that time, I start from the 50s, start to go down very far, very sharp. That means architectural identity of Qatar start got thread. Uh, people will not apply it for some reason. And the modern architecture, which is the green one, start really soar up in its uh, domination in this region, or in this area. Other architecture might be the Islamic architecture. It's not really strongly presented when it comes to analyzing the buildings in, in Doha, but it is there, even though it's now it's going a little bit high, but with a slow uh, uh, implication. So now the question is, the shift and move of Qatar identity happened. And at the same time, we still have the present of the tradition of Qatar. So I have to ask a number of questions, create my own objective and method, etc., to achieve uh, the goal of this uh, research. First of all, what is the Qatari architecture? Actually, uh, Dr. Estaz uh, Mohammed Jida, actually, uh, Ibrahim Jida, uh, already defined what is Qatari architecture. And the second one, what is the contemporary architecture in Qatar? Another question. And, and another question number three, to what extent the identity is affected by outside? And this one, actually, I have to go to uh, some theory came from geography, which I had, uh, one of my degree came from geography. So Higar Strand, he's a Swedish geographer who created the idea of the diffusion of, of theory. And he has very interesting idea of how things move, how the language move between boundary, how the disease move between boundaries, how culture move between countries, language, religion, etc. And uh, according to his team, I'm gonna uh, divide it my, my, my presentation. At the end, we can have some really understanding of resistance or to change in, in Qatari identity. So the idea of the work happened like this one. First of all, we select areas which has different type of Qatari architecture, barrels, which mostly uh, has some Islamic and global. Souk Waqif is 100% uh, Qatari. Mushayrib is a Qatari, but with modern notion. And uh, we have West Bay, also it has a mix of different styles. From there, we, can, we go there to do some uh, field observation. From field observation, 
for God, I don't see. <laughs> Uh, from field of observation, we have to go to the people. Why you have to go to people? Because at the end, we are building for people. We are, our concern is the user, number one. When Campbell Lynch created the image of the city, and he went to create, uh, kind of really uh, find out how the people see cities, those who came from science, they say, so what? So what? So we know the image of the city. So how is that going to be beneficiary? How is it going to be applicable for us? The, the response was very simple. Very simple. When we know what the people see, we can know the strong and the weakness in the city, part of the city. So we can put more emphasis to on the strong, strong part and put another uh, work or, uh, or, or effort to improve the weak part of the city itself. So when you go to the people, you have to know how the people see things. So then when you put an effort, you know you are putting the effort, the money, the expertise, the time, all of that in the right place. Because at the end, the people who's going to be use it, going to be experiencing what you are building for them. I'm not going to build really beautiful architecture at the end, see people escaping out of it. There is an example in Yale University, I believe, when an architect, I think Philip Johnson, um, built a beautiful building uh, department and the, and, and the uh, architectural uh, journal write about it, how beautiful, how nice, but they found the students don't use it. Why they say when the, when the summer, it became like an oven from inside, so everyone go outside. So the beauty of the building didn't help to create successful architecture. It's a successful in terms of buildings, successful in terms of aesthetical issues, but it's not successful in terms of user at all to the left. So this kind of things you have to pay attention. So that's why we don't have to go to, to the people to see how they really think about what they are uh, looking at and what they conceive. So from there, we went to the people to ask some questions, using some photographs, and uh, at the end, the participant asked to also read the fusion theory regarding their knowledge, interest, resistance, decision, implementation, and adaptation of emerging ideas. So this actually the uh, method was for this uh, presentation. Uh, this is the fusion theory. Sorry, this is the fusion theory. Uh, this is the one came from Higar Strand. So we have information and interacts matrix. Those goes to the mean uh, information. Mean, mean information field is mean here, Doha, for example. And you have information coming from, flowing from outside, coming by expatriates, uh, expatriates or by uh, media or any way, uh, or any means. Interaction matrix, when they meet together, how things really interact, is there is a barrier. Barrier just means there is a mountain. And one of the, like um, Muhammad Ali, um, uh, the, uh, before Mr. Muhammad Ali, he said there is a, a mountain when this create or there is a boundary to show that this is a, a golf culture are different from the inland culture because there is some barrier between them. It's one of the barriers we may consider it. Another barrier could be the language or the, or the culture or the media, for example. When you are not allowed to interact with another people, that's happened when we have Syria uh, dispute with Iraqi during Saddam Hussein and Hafez al-Assad, they say people cannot interact to create really political bore, uh, bo barrier between two people, two, two societies who are one, but they cannot talk, they cannot interact in any way for almost 30 years. So imagine that can't be happened. So now if both of this information are rich, they mean of information field, so in this way, and they survive from the resistance and the barrier, so we'll have to have the field when things happen. Is Doha, for example, we either take as it is, the international style, or you may Work with it to make it fits your own taste of the beauty. Example, the pizza in America and pizza in Italy. The pizza, you eat a pizza every day. You say it's American pizza or Italian pizza. When the American take it, adapt it to change it to be American. It's really, totally different. So when I ask one of my Italian friends, uh, he say, totally different from Italian pizza, for example. Here's the same thing. So you can adapt something, but you may put your own flavor to it, which is here your own identity. It became mixed between the source, where it came from, and your own local identity. That's what we call it sometimes postmodern architecture or new vernacular architecture. 
and this is what happened. So this is a theory, and this is the theme. I'm going to work on it, uh, uh, dividing my, my research according to that one. Here, by looking at the history, I'm not going to talk about the history anymore. We, we heard from the source, the pure source about the history of, of uh, this place. However, I refer to one thing. Look at these two pictures, for example. Doha before and Doha now. And you can see the difference between both of them. I refer to uh, Nurberg Scholz, if you know this uh, writer, he's a German, about his uh, genius Lossi book, he wrote it. When he say there is potentiality or, or beauty of something, but we don't see until we implement it. For example, he said there is two mountains. If you put a bridge between them, you can see there is connectivity between these two, 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 two mountains when you apply bridge to it. And here I can refer to the same idea of his uh, thought, saying that all this beauty of now, what we see of the shore line of, of Doha, the Cornish line of Doha, was hidden until we discover it as a designer. We are living in a place, they have, before 50s, they were poor people. When they discovered the oil, everything changed, right? So the, the land is rich until we brought this richness to the surface and became really looks unique as it is. So Doha, is the same thing, has a lot of rich in its identity, in its uh, heritage, in its people, but we need to bring those together, somehow discover them to create uniqueness to the place as we can. So this is the way I look at it from this uh, pictures. Uh, another one here, just remind everyone about how the Islamic architecture usually as a city, Islamic city, how it looks like. There is always center of mosque and commercial and leading uh, uh, main road to the center and the build buildings are surrounding this place. That's what usually happened in, and also in Doha, but the Doha from before and now, we can see there is more than one center this is a, a global uh, trend, more than center. So we refer to another theory which, which says city within cities. City within cities. So Doha is not one city. Some people may sit in part of the Doha for their entire life, never seen the another part of, of, of Doha, because another part of Doha it's, it has its own center, its own neighborhood, its own activities. And if you don't have any business with it, you don't go to it. So Doha has become really growing up with more than one center as it is. Very humble three image of different type of buildings. I bought this one because I am going to analyze those very quickly by looking at that one. So the summary of looking at quickly about this uh, architecture, to look at the main element of architecture and divide them between static and dynamic. As I say, static is something, if you change it, people will not recognize it. So it has to stay as it is. Arc is one of them. Arc, we have a number of types, 12, 12 type of arcs in the world. There is a Mamluki, Saljuki, uh, Osmani, uh, uh, Romanian, uh, Kotek. There is so many of them. Once you play with them, all of them, we cannot say pointed arc just like this. There is every, many arc are pointed. So which one pointed arc are referring to? Do you want uh, a UV pointed arc? Or, or, or the uh, Seljuqi, what they refer to it now as Iranian, which is not Iranian, it's Seljuqi arc, pointed arc, they are totally different. So this arc has to be static. If you want to apply it, you have to refer to it, or give it its name. Once you change the proportion, the whole arc type change. However, other things are possible to change. The ripped elevation, I think it's static, even though Musharraf, they have used it. Uh, and we can go with a number of things I propose it here as, as, as it is. So the character of space and form that are typical to traditional Doha are the existence of clustered low high buildings. It's number of the one things we can see from the building, traditional building. Building frontage uh, touch each other and all flow a connected building line. What I'm doing here, just summarizing the study has been done by analyzing this old city. You can read it if you want, but we can see building are connected Low rise, it has some features to adapt it to the, to the uh, uh, climate and to, uh, and to meet the social re uh, requirement of the society. 
from that, from that uh, one, we, we, we start looking at different regions. We select four, uh, five, sorry, we select four areas, as I say, with different uh, architecture and urban design pattern. The first one is uh, Pearl Qatar, is an example of mixed of district architecture. Qatar is not really every building has different style. No, it has district has different style. That's what it is. And in, in, in this uh, study, is what we, we have done, it looks like people, when you refer to Pearl, if they are not living there, they think always they bought Arabia. And their response came from that reason, when we make survey, came always analyzing Pearl as Port Arabia, not as a Pearl uh, as a whole. So it is a mix of district with different architectural style. Second one is the Souk Waqif, you know, it's a purely 100% static Qatari architecture. Third one, sorry, since so talking about uh, um, Souk Waqif, just a quick, uh, an old interview happened with uh, uh, Mr. Ibrahim Ajida. He referred that Souk Waqif is a good example. So the government has really two. It's good, good things that the government preserve Souk Waqif and also he wants that the government also to encourage a movement toward preserving historical site. That's beautiful things came from the local people who experience and see the, the success of such work. Um, now, the third example came from Mushareb. Mushareb is an example of the dynamic aspect of traditional Qatari architecture. So we have to locate it as a dynamic, not a copy. We are not copying here. We are changing. But at the same time, we can see the beauty of the identity of the, uh, of the, of the uh, district itself. Some example about how part of it has been came from tradition being adapted in, in Mushareb um, design. Uh, OSP mostly international style, however, the most important thing is uh, Barzan Tower has been set in a corner that when people go to the West Bay, always come across it somehow. So if you ask them about it, does it has any Islamic or Qatar architecture, you say yes. However, if they have taken different roads, they may say no, because most of West Bay are, looks like international uh, style, more or less. Now we ask the, the, the people, we have almost 90 people we interview, and we ask them just to put a ranking, which one of the building they, they think is, is more representing uh, uh, Qatari architecture, or yeah, they, we can see that uh, Souk Waqif was number one, so Mushareb was number two, Beryl number three, and Westby was the last selection for them. The idea of this, of, of, uh, sorry, the idea of arranging card, I, I use it in my PhD a long time. I found it very easy for people. People usually don't like to answer uh, verbally and difficult to, to start reading a lot of questions. Make the interview as a game. Put on a card, say, can you put them in order the way you like? And when they do that, we record it. This is what happened. And, uh, and this is a we can see Sukhwa Khif still on the top of the list of people uh, selection. Another uh, survey was looking at different buildings and ask people the same thing. Uh, uh, how much is it really uh, uh, Qatari or Islamic uh, or uh, international or a mixed style, those pictures are, uh, they are. And you can see Barzan Tower, Sharq village, and Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab Mosque ha wa has the top uh, 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 presentation, uh, uh, percentage. Uh, 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 the mosque of uh, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab was almost uh, 89, almost 90 percent. People say it is really represent the, the local architecture. While the Sharq, they look at it as 72, and Barzan Tower as 63. Sounds uh, acceptable, those uh, number came from the uh, people. Uh, another, another uh, two, two different buildings, and Musharib and, uh, and uh, uh, modern uh, art. Uh, the Museum of Modern, uh, Modern Art, we can see that uh, Mushareb has 60% as a Qatari, 30% as modern. However, the Museum of uh, Modern Art, 77%, we can see the elevation of it mostly, Qatari looks like, and 10% uh, only as modern architecture. 
another more uh, uh, photos. I see there are 10 photos and how they, uh, people really select their, uh, uh, they are cutter or not cutter. You see OSP, almost 87, uh, they say uh, different non cutter as a modern non cutter Now we look at elements. So first of all, yeah, I, I'm almost done. First of all, I was looking at district. Second, I was looking at building style. Now I'm looking at elements. We set a number of elements. I will look at only six elements now to see how the people see this one or Qatari, non Qatari. The first one was ranked, the first one was Brazil, ranked as 89, 82 as a Qatari uh, element. Second one as 85 as an Islamic, the pattern. The third one looks like they call it as Islamic again. The third one here, this uh, Mishrabiya, 98 as Islamic, almost 100. When you look at the wooden traditional ceiling, you see that from down there, they say it's 96 as Qatari, which is interesting. And the last one is uh, the, the tower in the West Bay. You look at it as a 71 as Islamic. But they don't say it's really as Qatari in any way. There are so many actually questions, so I will look at only uh, look at the title and go through one one example for 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 the time being. Uh, here we're trying like at the main information field, we ask uh, people right away a statement saying that the identity of Qatar survived from the encouragement of the contemporary architecture. 35 they say, agree, only 35 agree. That means they still people think it might not. Contemporary architecture in Qatar is a mix of style and doesn't present Qatar, 74, they say agree, and so on. So there is a number of questions like this. Uh, another questionnaire was asking uh, people about the uh, information interaction, talking about the uh, influence of the modern architecture. They found the commercial has high influence in terms of architecture. When you go down resident list, an institution has 20%, government and educational. However, religious and industrial, zero, influence of modern architecture. So many interesting uh, questionnaire has been set, and as you see it, barrier resistance. Yeah, okay, I, I can, uh, here we are talking about barrier. We can see the, 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 the reason why some of the international or modern architecture didn't go through, they say building regulation. Without building regulation, you may find more modern architecture really imposed on Qatar. So building regulation put something. That's the way people see it. Religion, lifestyle, and, and the climate has, has created a barrier to, 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 to use uh, to, or to copy modern architecture in Doha. Okay, since uh, I've been getting some threat, thus I have to finish, wrap up. A preference, which style they prefer, most of people, 42, they say prefer traditional. That's interesting. And combine, uh, uh, we have less. There is a number of questions here. Uh, people ask statement, uh, they look at it. I look at the first one, say, today Qatar architecture has a strong connection with history. 70% uh, strongly disagree. Wow, <laughs> and so on. So uh, I'm sorry, I uh, cannot go through all of this. There is three of these uh, pages, uh, 10 questions, 10 statements. And this is a summary of those 10 statements. Recommendation from that one, so when we look at this one, we have to do some recommendation. However, if you want to go through it, you, you are welcome. I read only two of them. The yellow one, the urban and architectural identity should provide a sense of continuity with heritage context. So the idea is not to say, yes, bring everything as it is, it's beautiful, it's going to be uh, accepted for Qatar. No, it has to have some really continuity from the heritage of the place. The, uh, in response to the climate circumstances, the use of open courtyard, uh, etc should be considered as a st statically or dynamically adaptable element. So that means, remember those elements of Qatari ar architecture can be used in one way or another, either as static or as a dynamic. You adapt them in your design and you can see you are preserving the identity of the place. Okay, um, this is my final few statement. The urban pattern and architecture characteristic and identify an iconographic of the place, etc. And you are welcome to ask any question at the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I, th I think you, you would agree with me that we had uh, a very, very interesting session. Um, and uh, I want to open the floor for discussions, but I just need to provoke you and stimulate you a bit by sort of uh, shedding light quickly on, on what I've kind of learned personally from the four narratives. And uh, I would start with, uh, with what Ibrahim said regarding what I would call it the very first wave of globalization within Qatar when he uh, showed us that what we label as traditional Qatari architecture culture is also a sort of uh, influence coming from different geographies around, uh, around the country. And uh, uh, he stressed also the idea of how to uh, learn from principles and concepts as opposed to learn from the skin or only the visual uh, vocabulary of, of uh, the heritage. And uh, uh, what was interesting that Brother Muhammad continue or substantiated the same argument, suggested also that it's a, it's a fundamental question, is an existential question to ask about our identity. And he narrated this beautiful story about a friend or a colleague telling him, what do you guys have in the Gulf? It's only a desert or a couple of camels. And, and how he narrated with us a, a very long historical story that suggested that we have a very concrete uh, identity and sense of being. Uh, and also he stressed the notion of the language of architecture as opposed to the style of architecture, which was also interesting, the word language, because uh, Nicholas also uh, presented his, uh, his paper based on the notion of the pattern language. I was a student in, in, of Christopher Alexander in, in UC Berkeley. He, he, he authored a wonderful book called A Pattern Language, and he, he used the word language to suggest that within any language, you can be very creative. So language is not a straight jacket. On the contrary, you can, as long as you, you know that it's a, it's, it's a set of principles and concepts concepts and meanings and ideas. Uh, and therefore, Nicholas uh, creatively started to, 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 to come up with his own pattern language regarding our regional and, and, uh, and local architecture uh, and was suggested in uh, beautifully narrated eight patterns. Each of them would start with a, a beautiful slogan and then how the slogan is represented in a way that again can open a, a lot of uh, horizon for creativity and innovation. And then finally we had Professor Salim suggesting that architecture and heritage has static aspects and dynamic aspects and he had his own interpretations for that which I think would definitely open the floor for a lot of debates and, and, and questions. So I'm expecting a lot of questions. Who would be the very first hero? Here you go. Thank you very much to all of the participants for the uh, in light giving in this uh, session. Um, I have a question about uh, the architectural typologies of traditional architecture. So some sources are actually classifying this as uh, um, the, the architecture of the Gulf as uh, the uh, Arabic uh, masonry and Persian masonry. Uh, have you encountered in your research uh, or in your studies uh, such classification uh, is this classification uh, uh, working with, with uh, covering all the typologies that we have uh, can we actually have only only Arabic and Persian or are there any other classifications that um, maybe are not as famous uh, actually I uh, I think that the architecture of the Gulf is very typical, well rooted in the area, belong to this area, developed in this area. Uh, but uh, as Brahim said, that still some some influences from the surrounding can penetrate into this style. Uh, on the eastern uh, shore of the of the Gulf, for example. You don't see a lot of pointed arches. You don't see a lot of round arches, but you see the corner arches, for example. The corner arches, I think that it is more typical of the eastern 
sure than the... For example, when you go toward Kuwait, you begin to see Iraqi influence, uh, more Iraqi influence. When you go to Al Hufuf Al Ihsa, you begin to see the inland influences from Najd, for example. But uh, it is not, not uh, the, the term itself, it will not uh, apply 100% when you say this is a Persian or not. Go ahead. All right. Um, if you are asking about the origin of things, you have to go deep in the history. The uh, courtyard is not Islamic, but has been adapted and became an Islamic. It was mostly Ashur, Ashurian, Assyrian style. And there, the, the, the courtyard was, has no colonnade, no, it's called mashraqa, or like a terrace on the upper floor, or, or, or windows, uh, uh, we call it a corridor from the upstairs with, with windows. They don't have that one. It was only like a, like a hole. Uh, but has been adapted because it's good for privacy. When you talk about the E1, E1, it was used to be used in the Temple of Fire in, in, in Persian uh, history. And uh, they use the God of Fire or the God of whatever, they put it there. Has been taken and been used because it has really good uh, uh, mixed or mere, uh, marriage with the inner courtyard because they put it in the south. That's what, if you, that's what you mean. The Arab masonry type would have bearing walls and then the roof on t without any decorations and with minimal openings on the walls, whilst the Persian style will have these spears and the recessed uh, uh, panels and decorations that we have seen, for example, in the, in the example of the National uh, Museum. So this is the classification that uh, researchers are now adapting. Okay. Ibrahim would respond to that. Go yeah. ahead, sir. Actually, as much as we were influenced by the trade and so on, the shores of Persia were sort of influenced architecturally by the Arabs. It's not vice versa. But as these Arabs migrated there, they have adopted to some masonry, some techniques, to the wind tower, and brought it back. So it's, a, it's an interim change. So I w the Gulf architecture belongs to the Gulf. There isn't such a thing as Iranian Gulf architecture or Qatari Gulf. Or, it's all this voc unique, beautiful vocabulary has been created within these shores and exchanged. And it depends what materials you had and what prevailing wind you had. There was some uh, adjustment. Otherwise, it's, I wouldn't say this is given to that or this. There was another question here. You mentioned that cities are younger than their inhabitants. Can you elaborate further or relate it on how it, will, it affects the Gulf architecture or the vernacular architecture we're having right now? Since um, we have been discussing about the identity and uh, the identity of the Gulf architecture and it's very evident in the presentations that with the, um, the transition from the pearl to the oil that g gave um, the region its uh, modern um, architecture right now. Okay, um, I'll, I'll give you a very personal, not very theoretical um, comment or answer on your question. Um, I studied mostly in Berlin in the 1990s. And after the fall of the wall, there was a certain confusion about how to build up Berlin with all the new government buildings and so on. And then some of my professors at that time came up with the slogan of a Berlinish architecture. And they had actually invented an identity that um, had no bigger roots, but it dominated the whole discussion about architecture. And today, nobody's talking about this anymore because these professors have retired. During my studies, I went to Singapore for, uh, to study there as an exchange student, and they never looked back. They only looked forward. And I found this very liberating as a European to be in an environment where 
the actual problems were tackled in a constructive way and the image machine was not used to overlay architectural solutions. And so I found it an interesting contrast personally to see what happens to an architectural culture and what are the potentials if the reference points are only in the past or maybe they are in the present. And I see this as an interesting chance for the generation of architects who practice now in this region to have an open discussion about how to solve the actual problems of these cities. Does that answer your question a bit? Any more questions? A little bit Arsh, on, on okay. this. Uh, uh, about 2000, uh, year 2000, 2002, uh, around this years, uh, in Doha we had these uh, towers were booming like uh, mushroom in, in West Bay. And actually, it, it was frightening that uh, we were losing our, our uh, uh, local architecture. And at the same time, the internationalism and globalism was invading our, our town without doing anything. And actually, it was His Highness the Father that felt about this danger. And he took the decision of bringing back Sukhwakov to its, uh, to its uh, what is today. And uh, I felt that uh, part of nostalgia that, uh, you know, when we see these uh, glass towers, we feel that uh, we are alienated by, by this modernism. We feel that we would like to see our past because we see in it a little bit of romantic, a little bit of uh, warmth of our uh, purity of our past. So uh, uh, bringing back the Sukhwakov, I think it was insisting, no, uh, the, the, the local and our local identity should be uh, obvious and should be clear. We will not let this uh, globalism uh, swallow our, our culture and our identity. But now you have a final question? Okay. So I, I'm really sorry because, uh, oh, Fodil is my great friend, so I cannot. <laughs> final question. It's very final and very short. Is already over oh, sorry. You want to delay it for tomorrow, it's fine. Go ahead. No, no, go it's ahead. It's for Nicholas again. It's go ahead. Uh, your f presentation, your cover slide is uh, efficiency identity. Very briefly, in two short sentences. Where was the identity of the golf architecture presented in the buildings you showed to us? And what do you refer about efficiency? Was it tested? I would call it energy efficiency, spatial efficiency, function efficiency. How was that evidenced in certain buildings, especially the one in Kuwait, the Wind Tower building, 2017, by AGI? Thank you. Um, I think you're touching the uh, right next chapter to research in. Um, I do not have data about the actual measured efficiency of these buildings, but I appreciate the um, categories that you mentioned. So it's not only energy efficiency, space efficiency, for example, is a very important uh, topic. So I do not have further information. I look at these buildings and I judge them from my, say, experience as a designer. Um, the Qatar Foundation headquarter, I don't think you can open a window there. So you could question efficiency measures, but potentially this kind of architecture is very, it's very inspiring what it could be you could move it further. So it's 
in a way a wild guess, um, but I feel okay with it. I think it's fine to start a discussion, and that's all it was meant to be. And the in identity question, just to say that, it's on the same level. It's the first time I've put this together as a thought. And I think the examples we've seen without repeating the whole story shows that these buildings are as they are because they are at a certain place and not anywhere else. And that gives it an identity, I think. All right, with that said, uh, please join me to thank the four distinguished speakers. And I will give the floor to James to direct us for tomorrow. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, tomorrow we resume uh, with day three of the uh, Architecture Week. Uh, so see you there then. The program, if you don't have it, is available over here on your right. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>